really made him so, a name for himself in the, the dinghy cruising um, sector, really. He wrote a book in 19, well, was published in 1999 about his designs and about his philosophy and um, techniques of building. And it was called the, the, the backyard, uh, New Zealand Backyard um, Boat Builders Book. And it's been, it's turned into one of the greatest investments ever because they cost about $19. But now you see them advertised on um, you see them advertised on Amazon and things for nine hundred dollars. So they've got it's outdone gold. It's outdone, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Berkshire Hathaway and everything else. But um, so John's made his name with that, and he's um, John is very close to uh, John in the White there with Howard Rice, and Howard is a um, has done a lot of small boat adventures over the years, and. Um, so they've done many small boat adventures and started in particular in um, clepper canoes and tiny little canoes. And so when, once he met John Wellsford, after doing big adventures in his canoes for years, when John had um, designed the Scamp um, as an 11 foot 11 um, boat, um, Howard immediately fell in love with John because having um, recording in progress, ha having, having mucked around in, a, in canoes and then moving on to a Scamp. Things couldn't have got better, so he fell instantly, fell instantly fell in love with John Wellsford, and they've become firm friends and uh, partners in crime for doing many things. So it's uh, a great uh, pleasure and privilege that we, that uh, John and Howard have uh, honoured us with their um, their presence and uh, pleased to uh, speak with us tonight. And so we'll get underway. Well, I'll uh, start off. Uh, my name is Howard Rice. Yeah, my name is John Wellswood. And uh, we're coming to you from uh, the island of Nakanoshima in the Oki Island UNESCO Global Geopark here in Japan. Uh, we're sitting on the second floor of uh, a boat shop that um, I helped found and manage. Uh, we have a small audience here with us, one of my apprentices and another friend, uh, Lloyd Houghton from New Zealand. So we're very pleased to be here. Mm. So, yeah, and thank you very much, all of you, for uh, being here to listen to our little diatribe and stories. Yeah. Thanks, guys. So we, yeah. Well, actually, point of information, I never fell in love with him. <laughs> actually, John and I have known each other way 40 years, something like that. Yeah. Yeah, I was one of his very first uh, customers a long time ago. Mm, I first met Howard, it was by correspondence, but first met Howard. I had only just begun the uh, process of learning about yacht design and I came a long, long way and I'd like to illustrate some of that. So if we can have that first little video up, please, Matt. Yeah, so this is from a scamp, but it's on a really relaxed, calm, gentle day. And this is what a lot of people imagine that small boat sailing is going to be like. And I don't design for that. I design for a very wide range of conditions. What happens out there is going to be sometimes not within the control of the sailor. So you can see that that's really gentle stuff. And that's a scamp and it's enjoying it. So if we flick over to the next one, please. Yeah. Now, if you watch this one, here we go. Triple reefed. Really bouncy day. And there's a scamp, the same design, marching along, doing really well, right? making good progress. Wind against tide, a lot of current, a lot of waves. You can see that the boat's actually handling, handling really well. It's pitching, but the, the, the crew is right on the axis of the pitch. So it's not been bounced up and down as much as would otherwise. The boat's not throwing a lot of spray on board. It's pushing it aside. It's making good progress in some pretty awful conditions. So the, the designer has to have both of those extremes in mind. But if we can go to the next one, please. That's picture number one. I wanted, I had a holiday coming up. I had three months and then a holiday of three weeks it was the first that I had for a while. I wanted to go for a trip, right? I didn't have a boat at the time, bad man. So I corresponded with Philip Bolger and I drew a sketch 
and said, this is what I think I want. This is what I want to do. Um, what have you got that would suit? And he wrote back, he's an excellent correspondent, and I wish I'd kept his letters. But he came back and said, hey, I think what you're doing there will be really good. Why had you done this, that, and the other? Some of the features of the design, because it's quite different to his Gloucester goal. He said, well, look, where I'm going, I'm going to be experiencing heavy surf, and I'll be running downwind in most of it. I'm going to be in high winds, and it has to track right, has to be balanced for wind, and a number of other issues. He came back and says, yep, I agree with all of that. Go for it. So the light dory, Mark II, the Mark II just refers to some structural differences as well as built. And I rode that boat from Dagobal in the north of the, of the Kuiper Harbour down to Helensville at the very southern end, which is something like 90 miles away, but I went up most of the estuaries on the way and I had a 10-day rowing um, holiday moving only when the tide was going in my direction, of course, which was one of the life-defining experiences of my life. So next one, please. And sort of at the other end of the scale of small boat adventuring, here's what you can do with a small boat that you can't do otherwise. Creeping around in amongst bush, up against the real edges of the water, the interesting stuff. So a little comment from, from Howard. Yeah, so <clears throat> obviously that's a stamp and it's a boat that uh, does all of those things very well. One of the attributes of the boat that I really uh, was attracted to, and I'm gonna get into some of the, uh, the minutia about the stamp, is the fact that it will actually sail upwind in about a foot of water because of uh, the bottom design, the long skegs, uh, the centerboard, the offset center board is really not needed. So you can actually go to weather in very shallow water, given that uh, bottom drag is also an issue, but uh, the boat performs remarkably well in exactly those conditions. And I've taken it to <laughs> the other extreme a little bit, as you'll learn a little later. Mm. Thank you. Next one. So one of the things about being a designer, now I've learned a little along the way, and in fact, a few years ago, I was um, headhunted by Massa University, Albany, Auckland, to go and teach part-time at their um, marine design course there, which I tell you, I learned faster and more teaching that course than I've ever done. And it's um, brought home a lot of the things that I do because I thought they would work now I know why they would work, and it's given me the ability to design to a specific set of conditions or requirements that I couldn't have guaranteed before. So Pathfinder with the cabin on, we have people, customers who wanted a cabin on their big open boat. Now Pathfinder is quite big, it's a bit over 17 feet long, and they wanted some accommodation. All right. What kind of accommodation would you like? Oh, something simple. We just need a space to put all our gear so it won't get wet. We just need a space to lie down in. So that gave me an opportunity to design a small, proportionately appropriate cabin where it's like a backpacker's tent inside. So listen to the customer. The customer dictates what's required, but there's a lot around the customer's requirement that I have to go and find out. Where is it going to be sailed? How is it going to be sailed? How skilled are the people? What sort of resources have they got? All those things. Next one, please. So we go up a bit. Some people need more, right? And you'll know what this is, right, Matt? So this is Keith Smith's penguin. And she's now your rigged. She's got um, an enormous amount of space inside, as people know. It's this was designed as part of and my entry into a design competition run by a local magazine. 
So I had a look at the brief, which required good accommodation, able to be handled by one person, able to be rigged by one person. It needed to be have a self-bailing cockpit and a number of other things. So Penguin came out of experience with other designs, and I was beginning then to be able to design for a specific performance envelope. So the first thing I did with that as I did a rough calculation of the weight that one would expect to, to be carrying when you have four people and two adults and two children, perhaps in their early teens, away for two weeks. So how much in the way of stores? How much in the way of water? How much in the way of fuel, clothing, right? Even down to toothbrushes. So I worked out roughly how much that was going to take. And then I drew a boat around that requirement. So again, listen to the customers. So next one. Now, this again was a listen to the customer job. I had the gentleman who ran Boat Books Auckland at the time come to me and say, we've got a bunch of idle alongs, right? They were 14 and a half foot very overpowered plywood boats. And there had been a very large fleet of them pre-war and through into the late 1950s in the Auckland area. He said, they're all going rotten, all falling to bits, and we need a boat to replace them. All right, sat down, talked to him. Okay, what he really needed was a race trainer for three teenagers. So the hull form of Navigator was developed out of that, right? Flat bottom, little plane. Its, um, its lines are such that as it heals, it will maintain its, its direction without ex excessive weather helm, but it's got a short, stubby little centerboard. So the idea being that with the big sloop rig that the race trainer would have, the sloop rig had all the controls, all of the lines, everything that the bigger, small, race, high performance keelboats would have. The ones that they race are around about eight meters long. And, um, but with the short, stubby centerboard, the boat, first of all, it won't trip. If it's heeled too far, it slides off to leeward. And the other thing is, if the lateral trim, the heel, is not maintained at exactly the right heel the boat doesn't perform as it should so it, it teaches then i had a friend come along and say hey the boat that i've got's a little bit small i want to go cruising i want to go a lot further than i can in my small boat so we went through all my drawings and he pulled this out and said hey what about this with a different rig on all right so all right, what do you want to do? Well, it's an open boat, so it's going to have a tent. It's going to be single-handed most of the time. It would be nice if it would self-steer a bit. It needs a short mast so I can get it up and down easily on my own. Right, so again, more listen to the customer, right? Write down all of all of the criteria. So we came out with the navigator yaw. And there's now somewhere around 750 sets of plans out for that boat. Almost all of them have been built your rigged. Probably half that number, actually, have been built. Now, the rig is set up so that with the jib and the mizzen only, the boat is balanced. It's controllable. And it's down to a very short rig. It's, so the big, if a big squall comes through, First, the main sheet can be let go completely and, and the boat will still be balanced on jib and mizzen, controllable. If it's really getting bad, dump the whole mainsail. There's three reefs in it. So reef one, reef two, reef three, dump it. And then if the really bad weather persists, roll the jib up or drop the jib and sheet and mizzen in, the boat will sit roughly head to wind in quite bad conditions. It'll drift very slowly backwards. It'll hunt around just a little bit, maybe 15 degrees off either side, 
but that mizzen is enough to hold the boat bow to wind. And it's really, really nice. I've had people say, hey, we didn't know what we were doing when the gust came through, but we remembered, right? Drop the main. They dropped the main, sheeted the mizzen in, and just sat there, and the boat was felt safe. Crew members who were getting frightened and upset didn't get traumatized. The boat just sat there. It was really good. Next, please. And here's one you'll know, right? So this is Phil McCown rowing in FRTT, in FRTT, in the Salish 100, in the roughly in the, in the Puget Sound area. He says that even with oars that really weren't the right ones, the boat moved along quite nicely under oars. The sail area, once there was a, any wind at all, it sailed really well. Now, Howard Rice was part of the build on that. He went in and helped Phil get the boat up and finished. Yeah, I was very impressed with uh, the boat. The, the interesting story there is that John hadn't really finished the plans. So we were sort of shooting in the dark and on the phone off and on uh, for those weeks that I was on board. So I'm looking forward to sailing on the boat. I haven't sailed one yet. Mm. So what happened there is Phil came to me and he'd built a couple of my boats before and said, hey, I want to do the Texas 200. Right, and That's a, a five-day blast up the coast in the intracoastal waterway um, on the Texas coast of the Gulf of Mexico. It blows hard. Almost every time they run the event, it blows hard over the starboard quarter. All the flat land inland heats up lifts the air up. It's a little bit like the um, Fremantle Doctor, and it blows hard. It blows anywhere between 20 and 35 knots, and it blows solid. So Phil wanted a boat for that, and he wanted to go cruising a little bit. He wanted a little bit of comfort. So I said, no, you don't want the walkabout. What you want is the one that I'm drawing now. Now, I designed that boat for myself. The idea would be that it would be capable of sailing right around the North Island of New Zealand. Now, there's a very, very long stretches which are analogous to the west coast of Tasmania, long stretches with no shelter. You have to stand off with a, a very strong southwesterly prevailing wind. So it has to be good to windward, has to be able to cope has to be able to be self-righted in um in a hard chance just by the one occupant and not only get it back upright but get it going so like a scam once it's upright it's stable once it's upright it's actually got not that much water on board they come up reasonably dry that's due to the side tanks it's got the high up buoyancy of the scamp that being the forward half of the little cuddy cabin. It's got the shelter of the scamp sit in the cuddy cabin. It's just a tiny little bit bigger. It's got a, also an area aft, oh, sorry, offset centerboard, working my way back. Right. Can we have the next one, please? Yeah, so now we can see a bit better. So side seats angled to sit on. It's got the same um, sliding seat that moves back and forth. It's not a sliding seat in the rowing sense. It's um, able to be moved. It can be moved for right forward and become the table when the galley is open. The galley in my one is actually a Trangia 27 on the back of the starboard side cabin hatch, as you see it there. Open that up. There's the Trangia with the heat shield clip it back, use it, blow it out, put it away. To put it away is just shut the hatch and, and close it. That's it. So sleep down the middle, head and shoulders in the cuddy as others. Buoyancy in both side tanks. Big water tank underneath. You can see if you look at the tiller, just to the right of the far end of the tiller, there's a filler tank, the filler for the tank. The off-center cases on the starboard side, as in the scamp. 
Now, that's an interesting thing, the off-centre case, in that I believe the boat should be designed for it because if the water flow in the area of the board, when the board is down, going to windward, if it is not the same on each tack, you're going to have a boat that will perform markedly different. So the hull shape is a large part of the design of that off-center board. Now in, the, in these, this um, board is pretty heavy. So it's got a doubled lifting tackle built into it. Now Long Steps was de designed, the first drawing was the rowing station. So this boat has to be able to row for reasonably long distances. It's not designed to have an auxiliary. So seat height, foot height, gunnel height, spacing, the height of the, the row locks in their blocks, the, even the angle at which the oar goes through the oar lock and down, the maximum angle is dictated by where the rub rail is. So there's a little calculation went on there to do that. I was very, very fortunate and Duckworks sent me a set of gecko oar locks and a set of oars. I'd been involved a little bit in, in talking about whether or not they should make those oars. So having done that, I then worked out that the ocean going rowing boats, and I've designed two of them, ocean crosses. At takeoff time, they are around about a ton and a half in weight. That's with all the stores and all the gear and the um, single crew on board. They are generally around about seven and a half to eight meters long. And this at just a fraction under six meters and at around a half of their displacement, I should be able to move that quite well. So coming further aft, you can see the access ports into the after end of the uh, side tanks. You've got access forwards and then in the cabin itself, there's a tiny little, uh, about a 250 millimeter space in the forward end, which is blocked off and they're accessible from in there. So there's a lot of watertight space in this boat, almost two tons of positive buoyancy. So come, where are we? We're back at the tiller. The tiller has a bell crank system, as you'll have seen on, um, Michael's boat. Mine's got racks to take two big solar panels. And uh, of course, the bell crank system takes the steering loads around the mizzen, which is right aft. So, can we go to the next one, please? So, this is where the design began. This is walkabout. So, it's a lot smaller, it's probably less than two thirds the volume. Chuck Lineweber and his friend ran that boat in the Everglades Challenge from Orlando down the western coast of Florida around the bottom and across to Key Largo. It's a pretty demanding sort of an event. You can go inland down the canals or you can go out. Um, they finished fourth in, the, in their class after stopping at a motel for breakfast twice, which I thought was not bad going, yeah? Next one, please. So I don't just design around the bigger boats. Here's another one where the customer was, uh, the customer's needs was paramount. Now this is scraps, which tells you what I built the prototype out of. And you'll notice that it's got a fairly flat shear. It was to go on the, um, up on the cabin top on a relatively small keel boat. So it's kept as low as possible when it's upside down. But if you look at the wake of it, the shape of the boat underneath is a little bit unusual and it's got the twin skis. The shape is closely related, particularly in the after end, to the scamp. Twin skis, the deepest part of the rock is further aft than normal. 
and it leaves a very flat weight. Those twin skegs tend to direct the water flow. Okay. Next one, please. And here's Sundowner, Charles Whipple, American, lived in Japan, saw my swaggy design, which is 18 feet, and what I consider to be the minimum really safe ocean-going yacht. And we exchanged emails for a little while, and he wanted to put, put this in, and he wanted to put that in, and he wanted to put another thing in into the accommodation, and he wanted a cutter, a gaff cutter rig. And eventually I said to him, here's a sketch. This is what you need. Swaggy is far too small. Now, this is 6.5 meters. It's, it's got a huge amount of internal space. It's got standing headroom for him and much, much more suited to what he wanted to do. So he wanted to sail it from New Zealand around the world. Okay. Okay. How far is it to, say, the Falklands if you go around Cape Horn? Because you're not going to go the other way. Ah, right. So we sat down and worked out 100 days plus at least 50 days spare stores on short rations, but 100 days. So we, I was working all this out, and then I got a, an email to say, I'm arriving in two weeks' time. Can you find me a place to build it? <laughs> at this stage, I had not much more than the sketch plus a, a couple of A4 pages of calculations. Oh, and it happened that four days after he was arriving, I was due with the family in Los Angeles and we were going to be away for a month. So anyway, he arrived, we found him accommodation. By that time, I had drawn all the hatches and a couple of other fairly complicated bits. We did some, uh, we did an, a workshop orientation, which actually didn't do all that, didn't do quite what I'd expected because he took two fingers off on my saw bench um, a bit later on. It slowed him down. Um, so when I came back, he had the hatches done and we proceeded from there. But that again, listen to the customer. This is what he wanted. There is nothing on that boat that could not be fixed or at least replaced with jury rig um, with the tools and spare parts that he was going to carry. That was a major consideration. You can sail it without the motor. Um, all the rigging was hand spliced. It was seven by seven plow line galvanized. Now I can tell you that you do not want roll a piece of seven by seven. Now that's got a rope core up the center of it. And that one of the reasons we use it is that you soak it in linseed oil and it preserves the line in salt air. You do not roll it up, soak it, um, and linseed oil has a strange property. If you get too much of it in one place with uh, flammable material in it, it catches fire. <laughs> and it caught fire while he, he had all of his first, uh, let's see, one, two, three, four, five, six stays, all nicely hand spliced, and um, it caught fire, and it doesn't go out. So he had to do it all again. Buried in sand, did it all again. Next one, please. So we go from a single-handed, moderately heavy displacement gaff cutter designed for long-range voyaging to a serious racer. This also is 6.5 meters. And it's designed for the mini transat race from Concarneau in France across to Guadeloupe in the Caribbean. Um, finished third, by the way, Canting Keel. It had two dagger boards up forward and one aft to control, so that the boat could be balanced. The boat's rules say from the bottom of the keel to the top of the mast. Remember, the boat six and a half meters long is 14 meters. This downwind with the kite up was carrying 2,400 square feet of sail. 
and his best one day run, 24 hours, was 256 nautical miles. Next one, please. Uh, John and I are coming to you today from, uh, as I mentioned, Nakanoshima Island in the Oki Islands of Japan. And uh, the photo that you see before you is the workshop that's on the floor below us. We're in the second floor of a um, small nonprofit bunk shop that I founded, uh, came to Japan uh, almost two years ago. And the boat you see in the foreground is a scamp. And those are uh, apprentice interns uh, working on scamps. So there are two in the building that were built from plans for uh, two owners here in Japan. So next slide. There you go. So that's where we are. And that's what I do uh, at this point in my life. Um, I've had a hand in, uh, interestingly enough, a very circuitous voyage forward in the building of 99 of these little boats. Uh, um, <laughs> number 99 is right there. So the scamp uh, is sort of the one avenue of sailing and voyaging uh, type that I like to, to use, small dinghies. I've, I've done a number of cruises, long distance cruises in uh, British Mirrors and uh, Philip Rhodes Robbins is design number seven. Um, I happen to like very small boats because of the opportunity that gives the operator to actually uh, be a third of what I call a third of the equation. The equation being the hull, the weight of the operator, me, and the power of the rig. And if I can bring those thirds into uh, some semblance of equality, I can overpower uh, the boat with my own weight and sailing skill. And this is very true of a scamp, even though it's a large, rather bulbous, largest 12 foot boat that I know of. Um, and I find it quite remarkable. And so what I'd like to do is uh, very quickly go through some images that might give you an idea of how I approach uh, small boat voyaging. And my friend John and I actually uh, have known each other for, we think, about 40 years through correspondence and having uh, taught a number of boat building courses together and small craft skills courses. Um, so we we kind of think the same. Uh, he's covered what he does very nicely. And so that philosophy worked well uh, when it came time for me to step into the, uh, the scamp world. So I'd like to start off by, before we go to the next slide, explaining a little bit about where I came from in boats. Uh, no one else in my family really sailed or was interested in the water, but for some reason, since I can remember being a human, I felt uh, like I was part of the sea. And it started with um, a little uh, styrofoam boat that I first bought. And at the age of 19, uh, I developed a boat, an 18 and a half foot cutter uh, with the Hostler SP salt steering gear and many of the attributes that you'll see in what I did to John's perfectly good design. Uh, the many modifications I made harken back to the age of 19. Um, uh, with that boat, I set sail from Newport, Rhode Island and uh, sailed down into the Caribbean and lived aboard for almost two years. Um, and that boat had uh, very interesting features that are quite similar to what I've done with uh, John's design, the scamp, a perfectly good design that I had the cheeky attitude of taking and modifying so it suited to purpose. So aft lazarette, footwell, the ability to uh, get the water out, keep the water out, and a number of other attributes. So if you can go to the next slide. So John and I as a team have uh, taught a number of these boat building courses. And uh, at the very end of my little uh, segment of the presentation, we'll talk about uh, briefly about the scamp camp phenomenon and how that's also changed the way that we think about small boats because the small boat is the object, but we become very invested in, as corny as it sounds, sort of changing people's lives. Uh, and that's a very true thing. And we'll, I'll touch on that in a moment. So next slide. So this is a photograph uh, taken during a training period 
uh, for a voyage that I did, a solo voyage, a 91-day solo voyage that I did some years ago when I was a lot younger. And it looks a bit extreme. I'm covered in ice and I've got goggles on uh, because it's 15 degrees below zero. And so my philosophy is, number one, preparation. I enjoy preparation almost more than voyaging or about equal to voyaging. Uh, this particular preparation was for uh, a solo trip I did in a sailing canoe, 91 days through uh, Tierra del Fuego and twice around Cape Horn uh, and back up the Beagle Channel and, and I explored west up as far as Timbales uh, in the northern arm of the O'Brien Channel of the Beagle Channel. So I never experienced ex uh, uh, conditions <clears throat> as extreme as this, but I went to the extreme so that in the end, living in a small sailing canoe, I could put myself into the just don't mind mindset uh, and survive for that time uh, solo and alone. And so next slide, please. I want to give you a few images of preparation. So I also trained rigorously, uh, running, weightlifting. Uh, I trained with uh, a friend of mine, Eric Stiller, uh, we trained in the old clever shop in New York City. I went there for the final six months of my preparation for going south to uh, Tierra del Fuego. And so this is a shot in the height of summer. Uh, I'm sorry, the fall. It's October. Uh, the weather, I can't remember exactly, but I think it was somewhere around 40 degrees Fahrenheit. But I sailed, I trained in a pair of shorts. As crazy as it sounds, I would sit at the time, I would watch TV and uh, immerse my hands in ice water. As extreme as that sounds, that's my level of preparation. And that's where John and I communicate very well. I think he articulated it nicely when customers come to him, um, you know, with what they want. Well, I didn't have to do that because the scamp popped up, it existed. And I chose it for a voyage that you're about to see. Uh, the person who called for that design and had John do the design, Josh Colvin, uh, sent it to me along with a few other people before the first prototype was built, asking for input. And uh, my opinion was that it was the wrong boat because it was only 10 feet, mm -hmm. 10 inches. Yeah. So I recommended that the boat be stretched by a foot because I thought it would add about 30% more volume and actually make the seating and the, the boat more livable. It wasn't John's, I, I don't know if it was his idea to make it that small, but I think that's what jo Josh had called that's for. Right. Yeah. yeah. And so it wasn't just my opinion. I'm not claiming that, but when the boat, so I, I wasn't in favor of the boat, but when it was stretched, I immediately, before the prototype was built, I bought kit uh, hull number two and number three. And the purpose was I was going to build hull number two as the stock scamp, not change a thing from the design and learn from it and whether it was the right boat or not. And then apply the modifications that I've used on a number of boats, starting with that 18 and a half foot boat I, I developed at age 19. Um, and then that would be my voyaging boat. And that boat was to sail from Goose Bay, Labrador, uh, across the Hudson Strait uh, to Baffin Island and across the Arctic Sea to Sissima, Greenland. And then I was gonna leave it there if I didn't have time at that point, but eventually get up to Disco Bay and then return. And so that meant that the boat would be rigged as a balanced lug rig. Um, and so, Certain factors came into play uh, in my preparation and uh, study of the area that dissuaded me from doing that. It was basically uh, the fact that the polar ice cap had moved offshore and there were a number of uh, polar bear encounters, a uh, very uh, dangerous situation. I couldn't see myself carrying a weapon. I couldn't see myself carrying a bear fence. I would be impeding in their territory. And I didn't just want to vector a course uh, from Goose Bay straight to Greenland, I'm not that interested in just straight open ocean uh, passages, which I've done. I prefer what small boats do in that sh that shot that John showed of the scamp poking around in the shallows. I like to explore the coastline and 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 do that sort of thing. So my preparation led me to a change. And so if you go to the next slide, um, <clears throat> this is a boat that. Uh, I built. This is a sailing canoe. 
And so this is the reason this slide is here is this shows that I have this predilection towards small boats and very, very seaworthy boats. This boat has full air sponsons on board. I'm able to sleep and cook aboard. I happen to be uh, reading a uh, little Conrad here in the morning as I've made coffee. And so, yeah, th this kind of a boat um, is very capable. I still have this boat. I've done open ocean passages with it in the Pacific. Uh, from the Angana Pompei out to Paquin and Ant and back, as crazy as, as that sounds. So the, my philosophy of, of voyaging is preparation, 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 uh, whatever the boat is. So next slide. This is the boat that I sailed around Cape Horn and lived out of for 91 days. And this is another training photo. And this is the stock boat. So I took a stock Clepper Aries 1, and I made a number of modifications. The leeboard system, the rig on this boat is standard Clepper. So I purchased the boat from Clepper because I don't do sponsorship of any kind. I, I don't have much money, but I do this for love. This is my passion. And then I modified this boat heavily, and it was able to, to I was able to live out of it for 91 days uh, with no resupply. Well, a minor resupply, but essentially that's what I was able to do. So next slide. Another shot of just the standard clepper, October, late October, it's freezing cold out, and that's how I train, preparation. Next slide. So this is actually departing Cape Horn. I've got my sail rig on deck. You might look out and wonder, what was I thinking? Um, <laughs> I wondered at the time, but it was, uh, it was a very windy uh, passage. I had been a number of days getting there, uh, very difficult, but I was able to paddle out from this location. Uh, there were three lighthouse keepers on the horn, and one of them used my camera and took this photograph. Um, and then I went off to the south and uh, rounded the horn twice and sailed out into the Southern Ocean and became very enamored with Tierra del Fuego. Uh, and as I finished that voyage in the Western Beagle Channel, I looked further to the southwest and realized that the real uh, the, the real Tierra del Fuego is a place that nobody goes to. Uh, John and I were in, in uh, Chile together uh, twice and uh, meeting with the Navy and the Armada de Chile rarely goes to the Southwest Islands. So I became very enamored with that area and wanted to go back. And I had no intention with my scamp of rounding Cape Horn. Some people think that that's what I intended to do, but I had no intention of doing that. My intention was to sail down the Strait of Magellan into the Beagle Channel and out into the Southern Ocean and explore Isla Hoste and Isla Basket, those islands that no one ever goes to because the terminus of the Roaring Forties uh, hits those, hits the western uh, side of Tierra del Fuego and through the hydraulics and the wind uh, that twists and bends around those islands, it's really, really treacherous. And so my theory is that why take a big boat? because big boat, big problems. I'm able to control a small boat, back to my theory of thirds. I can control a scamp with my own body weight. So next slide, we'll get into, uh... okay. So this is the boat that I chose. And this is the prototype, and I'm actually sailing in this photograph. This was the first time I sailed the scamp. Uh, I uh, was, you know, I purchased two kits, but I also got involved in doing the prototype testing. And this was the first day. This is December 27th uh, in Port, off of Port Townsend, Washington. It's about uh, 25 degrees Fahrenheit. And um, I really liked the boat. And this is the rig that I would have used had I gone from, had I sailed to Greenland. And so, um, next slide, please. So, this was my vision. This is what I wanted to do. Um, my vision was this, and I'd been there before. That's my uh, scamp number number two, uh, uh, rigged up, and I'm living aboard in Tierra del Fuego. So next slide, please. This is how it started. So I it was sent the design, then it evolved into the 11 foot 11 version, and I literally sat down in a restaurant with a sheet of paper, and I decided to respectfully take my friend John's perfectly good design and change it uh, in a number of ways. And some of these changes, these modifications would have been made for the voyage to Greenland, but the rig would have stayed the same. 
Uh, that's a totally different voyage uh, than going to Tierra del Fuego. And so the lug rig would have worked quite well. And if you look at this uh, carefully, and I'll take a, I'll give you a quick tour. The boat ended up, there are two of these uh, drawings, and about 98% of what I did here in these drawings, um, you'll see in the third slide from this one, actually came to fruition. And so you can see I put an aft deck on the boat, which didn't happen. Uh, there was a foot well. There are a number of, I don't know if you can read these, but uh, there, I put a bowsprit on it. I rigged it uh, with uh, a split rig. And um, uh, you can see the ore storage. I even carried a dinghy on board on the port side inside the cuddy, a very small uh, uh, boat to get to shore. If you could go to the next slide, please. And so this is the second drawing. And this one is really more important than the first one. Um, here you can see that I've added a foot well, and there are two large venturi balers. I have two vents in the transom. Um, and I also have a 10 gallon per minute uh, whale gusher hand pump, a 35 gallon per minute electric pump, four 12 volt batteries under the cab, the cutty cabin sole that were solely there not to be used until I uh, reached the Southern Ocean in the event that I had some uh, major catastrophe and I was driven far offshore into the Southern Ocean. I could have made for as wild as it sounds, I could have made for Elephant Island, I could have made for um, other, could have gone east and then north to Staten Island. Those four 12 volt batteries uh, would have powered the 35 gallon per minute whale gush or uh, electric pump on a, on a float switch uh, for weeks. Uh, and so those were only used for that purpose, but it also added another 100 pounds of ballast to the 175 pounds of water ballast in the center of the boat um, on, well, I shouldn't be pointing at the slide, but uh, if you look at the upper left corner, I had a sea anchor rigged up at all times, a para anchor that I could bury in the third wave uh, train ahead, solar panels, uh, deck prism, all sorts of things that actually all worked extremely well and made for a very good liveaboard a self-rescuable boat. I also carried two different tents. One was a high wind, low tent, and another uh, is, you'll see, is a three-pole tent that allows me to partially stand up. And the criteria for development of that tent was the ability to pull on a pair of pants. And as odd as that sounds, when you're anchored and all of a sudden something changes, getting your foul weather gear on quickly is more important than one might think. And that's actually how I determined the height of that tent. I made it minimally, uh, minimal height so that I could actually stand underneath it with my head bowed and get my pants on. Uh, next slide, please. So this is what uh, came about. I took John's perfectly good design and did all of these different things to it. And then when I elected to uh, not use the lug rig and go for a split rig, and there was a very defined reason for that because uh, sailing to Greenland sounds like a great adventure, and it is, but it's also relatively easy. It's light air, uh, predominantly light air if you look at the uh, the weather data for the months that I would have gone. And so the lug rig to me worked very well. I, I, I love the lug rig. It's great. But instead, Tierra del Fuego and sailing down the Strait of Magellan is a whole different situation. And so I configured a, uh, uh, a split rig and sent that to John and then John proofed it. So that was a collaboration we did. And John actually met this boat for the first time uh, in Punta Arenas when I opened the crate and there was the boat with all of these changes. And I'd love to hear what he thought about them. Yeah, I approve. We had corresponded about quite a lot of the bits and pieces he was doing. And there's, I was, um, very happy. The boat was going to be used in some pretty um, terrifying, <laughs> good word, terrifying conditions. You were there. <laughs> and um, yeah, uh, Punta Arenas, they run ropes around the footpaths when it's blowing so people don't get blown off into the, what, you imagine what the sea's like. So the rig has, has got some really interesting features all around the ability to make sail or reduce 
to sail very, very rapidly and to keep the boat balanced while doing so. Right. Another important feature of the boat that some people uh, have had big questions about is the cuddy cabin on this boat has a cloth door that I sewed and, and made. And it actually, I can inflate the cabin. So uh, in the event that the boat goes on its side, it'll stay on its side until I ride it, but it won't turn turtle because the cuddy cabin is inflated. And so the attributes of uh, all the flotation within the boat, including the inflatable cabin, meant that it would not turtle. And that was really critically important to me. And part of doing the testing of the prototype uh, was doing the capsize testing. I came back and did wintertime capsize testing and, and learned a great deal. Uh, it was a bit selfish that I did it, but I really needed to know what I needed to do to my boat. So I ended up doing finger holds and skegs and developed a, uh, a writing, it's a re-entry system, a sling system that allowed me to get back in the boat uh, in any circumstance. So both of the head sails, as you'll see in, our, in the, one of the following photographs, um, are on hark and furlers. And I never had to leave the cockpit. I could send out, I would send out a sail and a furler. And within the head sails, were sewn the head stay and the, the the stay for the staysail. So I could send out, the, I send out the furler and then I raise the sail and then I could unroll it, roll it up, drop it, bring the furler and the sail back to the cockpit and then stow that. And that was a very important thing. I often went jib and jigger just with mizzen and, and uh, head sole. I typically sailed with the staysail as my working sail. Uh, the mizzen mast is offset to starboard by 10 inches. You'll notice there's a boomkin, which is removable. Um, trying to think what other, oh, hiking benches, hiking seats, hiking strap, because you know, sail anchor, flat. Anchor stowage aft so that didn't have to go forward to anchor. There's a whole lot of features which meant that you didn't have to leave the cockpit or anything. Right. Um, there are not stays on this or shrouds. If you look at the photograph, uh, it looks like there are shrouds, but actually uh, the boat has two winches uh, with uh, contained handles, and those are running shrouds. And I came up with the idea of the running shroud because once I hit the Southern Ocean, it was going to be all downwind. Uh, I'd be sailing with the Roaring Forties, and uh, one of the reasons I chose the scamp over a boat, a design I was working on on my own, as soon as I saw the scamp, and I'd like John to talk a little bit more about the bottom shape because... The reason that I chose the boat with a pram bow, it has a 10, about a 10 inch stem, is so that down wave, down wind in the Southern Ocean where I'd experienced that uh, phenomenon before, I might be sailing in 30 to 40 foot waves, but wave trains, but they, the trough might be 150 feet long. So downwind, down wave, the boat would not have the tendency to purl at the bottom or stuff the bow in. Number two, without a long shapely stem, and I love boats with stems, but I also really appreciate the pram bow, the boat wouldn't, uh, it wouldn't purl number one, but it also wouldn't root. And rooting is where a beautiful stem, the hull becomes asymmetric for a moment and it wants to root either to starboard or to port. And that means that the operator has to counteract that with heavy helming and that creates the next oscillation and the next oscillation. And that's what leads to a potential capsize. But there's another element. And that's the fact that the boom, I can sail this with no shrouds. I don't need stays or shrouds. But those shrouds allow me to crank in head stay tension. That's all they're there for. But I can blow the shrouds. So downwind, down wave, the boom doesn't hit the stay or the shroud and ride up the shroud and become you know, a, a big round sail and then cause the boat to either capsize or add to that oscillation because the boat started to root, become asymmetrical. So I can just blow the shrouds and the, the mast will stand on its own. Uh, next slide. So here's what it looks like. This happens to be the guy who called for the design. That's Josh Colvin and I'm sailing him. Uh, but you can see the boat under sail, loose-footed loose main. Uh, I'm sailing in this particular shot with the Genoa and looks a bit sloppy, but the orange uh, strap on the side is one of the three prototypes as I developed the sling system. And the sling system is for re-entry only. And so what ha happens is that 
um, if you look at the middle of that orange strap, there is a little bundle there. And that bundle is uh, one of these heavy rubber twist ties. And so it stayed, there's one on each side of the boat. They're permanently mounted. And if you look at where Josh's right elbow is, there is a daisy chain there. And there are seven different uh, settings for this. And there's one more on the forward end. So if I was sailing with just myself, I'm five feet 11. But if I was sailing with someone who was uh, six foot three, or if I was sailing with someone who's five foot one in the water, they could easily adjust this. They can just snap on a carabiner to one of the other loops in the daisy chain. And that uh, that sling becomes uh, short, smaller or shorter. And the way that works, and John, uh, I, he's, well, he has it on his boats. Many people, I, I install these on all the scamps I build and I recommend it. Um, what happens is you right the boat, you grab the middle of the strap, you pull it and that uh, rubberized twist tie stays on the strap. You drop it in the water, you put your foot in, you put your other foot in, and then as you slide your feet apart, the catenary curve gets shorter. And all of a sudden, your waist is at the gunnel or the combing. And then it's simply fall forward into the cockpit, roll on your back, grab the tiller, grab the main sheet, and you're on your way. Uh, next slide, please. So <clears throat> this is a scamp during prototype testing. And so I learned a lot from this particular exercise. Uh, I did static testing in a slip and John drew the the bulkhead uh, in the boat, bulkhead number four, as an open bulkhead. So the cabin was open, but I filled those in because as you can see in this shot on the port side, if that, uh, this, I'm standing on a scamp <laughs> in the water and water is, some water is pouring into that forward cuddy, but by filling in the cuddy cabin, I gained the following after the, the following benefits. Less water came in. Number two, it allowed me to put a door in and create the, the inflatable cabin. And number three, I used those for, as you'll see in a moment, for many different factors. I had my compass, I had other hardware on there. I carried 250 feet of uh, line on each of those. I carried 600 feet of uh, line for do doing multiple tie-offs. Uh, when I did anchor at times uh, in Tierra del Fuego, it, it often took six tie-offs with that 600 feet of line and four anchors to make sure the boat was gonna be where it needed to be during the number of willy was that I experienced. So next slide, please. Uh, John and I met, he met his, uh, his you know, scamp in uh, Punta Arenas and I introduced him to all the changes uh in the boat and so that's just a great memory shot hey john yeah. <laughs> good job mate <laughs> uh, so next slide please it's always a little dicey when you do a lot of things to a boat and the designer i was a little pensive but uh <laughs> he and i communicated he loved it he, yeah. he thought it was great he told me what he needed and i did what was required i was happy with what he was doing it was good yeah and i learned a lot too yeah, so this is a shot of, okay, let's go to that next shot. I think that's a good one to look at. So this is uh, one of the tents that I made for the boat, and this is in half mode. And so this is the high wind tent. This is the the only one I used on the, on the voyage. I have a wood stove that I use in the boat. You'll see in a moment. But that wood stove is only used in the high wind, uh, in the, the general use tent. It's a three pole. So this is a no pole tent that I can literally, uh, in the dark, uh, I've got marked buttons on each end. I can, I put a finger rail on the back of the cuddy cabin. I can snap on the front, the back. I can use it in half mode, full mode. I can flip it the half back uh, forward. I can sit in the cuddy cabin with it buttoned down to the floor, sort of on an angle. So super useful, never leaked a drop. It survived uh, really, really, really difficult conditions. And I was very happy with it. Um, next slide. This is the uh, three pole tent. You can see the chimney for the wood stove and you can see the function of the hiking seats. Now the hiking seats uh, are very important because I'm able to, I, I use a, a combination of uh, a jack line hiking strap in the middle of the cockpit, which I can uh, unhook so that I can sleep in the cockpit uh, on the cockpit sole. But this is also where I would often sit. 
and I could un, uh, unzip the door on the side of the low tent and I could sit up and, you know, and get out and get some fresh air. This is how I would bathe and that kind of thing. So very important. Uh, the wood stove goes through the chimney in this. Uh, I, I lived on the boat again for 70 days uh, leading into winter and the wood stove is uh, really quite handy. Next slide, please. So here's the wood stove set up. That's a folding hearth uh, with metal legs that were made uh, by my friend Dave Mergener. Um, you can also see that everything is cushioned, even the cockpit sole. Uh, and these cushions were had one hard uh, snap and they affixed uh, with Velcro. And the reason everything is cushioned because sailing where I sailed this boat, uh, if I had, you know, a, banged an elbow badly or really wrenched a knee by falling on the cockpit sole, uh, I couldn't afford that. And so uh, everything is cushioned and that cushion, those cushions also add tremendous buoyancy. The cushions on the hiking seats flop down, that becomes a backrest. If you look at the helmet, you might chuckle, but actually the helmet's incredibly important, not for being, not as a protection against being hit by the boom, but I wore a particular life jacket system that I've developed where I could hook on a 100 foot polypropylene line on the front and actually go in on all fours through surf and slimy rocks and seaweed and, you know, deep holes. And so that helmet would keep me from slipping and falling and getting a concussion. Uh, and the goggles uh, I would wear during hail and uh, really driving rain. Uh, so the helmet I actually never had to use. I did go on those conditions at one point um, and didn't have time to put it on, but I got lucky and didn't get hurt. Uh, the wood stove itself folds up completely into the firebox. There's a water jacket on the left or the port side. The hearth comes apart and stows in the, under the port seat. The whole stove is uh, very compact. And I carried small hardwood bundles with a uh, fire starter in each one. Uh, the tiller has an under hiking stick because of the nature of um, the aft deck. I couldn't have a hiking stick on top. And I made it look like a Japanese katana because uh, I like that. So next slide, please. So this is the uh, three pole tent in summer mode. Uh, I've got full no seeing bug screens. Um, I can, you know, put wing out. I can let the forward pole go and it really is wings out. It offers great uh, ventilation. You can see the transom vents. Now the transom vents uh, are the two kind of roundish objects or holes in the back of the transom. So the idea there is it worked quite well is uh, should I be down wave downwind in the Southern Ocean and get a dumping green water wave over the back of the boat and the cockpit would fill up. It's a really big cockpit with a high combing even though the cutty cabin is fully inflated, I could hit the 35 gallon per minute electric pump with a, there's a switch in the cockpit. I could open the Venturi balers, but I might not be moving fast enough to actually get those to activate quickly. But the two vents in the back would automatically be blowing two big fire hose streams of water out the back uh, without me doing anything. And then I could end up with the 10 gallon per minute pumping out. Next slide, please. So there it is, that's what I drew, that's what I created. And this is just departing the Magdalena or departing the Strait of Magellan and the Magdalena Channel. And I happened to see one, one vessel during my 62 days aboard. I was off the boat for three hours in that 62 days. Uh, the, the British flag vessel Novara, a 60 foot uh, uh, ship or sailing boat that had just done Antarctica and it was in from the Falklands past me. <laughs> they were motoring. It was a great moment. They came over and they seemed very concerned. And they said, oh my gosh, do, do you need food and water? And I said, no, I've got plenty. Do you need anything? <laughs> and uh, they took this picture and, and sent it to me and I'm happy I'm headed south, uh, you know, full board. Next slide, please. And daily life, uh, that's, I wanted to show this photo. This is how I lived occasionally. You know, I would not occasionally, but I'd pull in an anchor and this happens to be a very calm spot, but you can see I've got anchors fore and aft uh, just in case. Uh, next slide. As much as it might be fun to see the rig and, you know, underway. This is um, uh, on the stretch. 
Trader Magellan. So next slide. Yeah. Life aboard, next slide. Scamp Camp, this is something John and I, we mentioned, we hope to be doing this in uh, Tasmania for the coming boat show in 2025. We can, you know, we'll, maybe you can talk about that amongst yourselves. Next slide. And I think we're done. Uh, this is day one of my voyage in the Strait of Magellan, shot by a long lens uh, reporter on land, and he sent me some images. So that's what it was like. It was uh, often like that. It was a great trip. And thank you very much for taking time to take a look at my uh, story. I really appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you, everybody. Thank yeah. you, Howard. Thank you, John. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. Terrific. The first question that came from the audience is, could you tell us about your inflatable cuddy? Ah, uh, yes. Um, the door uh, would roll down and I could snap it on the sides. And then I had two, what do you call the kinds of post? Uh, snap the dot, well, the, you know, regular snaps, but at the bottom were two of those post snaps. I'm not sure what they're called, push the dot or something. But inside I used inflatable bag, inflatable uh, airbags that filled up the entire space. Oh, uh, yeah, so what I would do in the morning, it was a bit laborious getting going in the morning. Uh, when I would get going, but I would inflate the cuddy cabin, snap the door down, but I could also, in a pinch, pull those out and actually get inside the cabin. I had a window that I sewed into the door. If I got, if I became hypothermic, I could actually get in there and uh, get warm. Good. Uh, thank you. Um, we've got a question from uh, Jeff McQueen. You probably know Jeff. He's uh, in his on his way circumnavigating around Tasmania in a Houdini. Yep. Hey, thank you for the videos in the past. Oh, no worries. <laughs> um, yeah, so first question. Um, seems the last few years, it seems like there's sort of been an explosion in popularity with dinghy cruising. Um, and I don't know whether that's just sort of the uh, Facebook groups that are building or if it's a real sort of increase. So I was just wanting to get your opinion, either John or Howard, is that is, is this a real explosion of interest in dinghy cruising? Or is it, uh, I think it's not start. Yeah, well, how would it start? Well, you know, I don't know what's happening in your part of the world, but <clears throat> in North America, possibly in Europe, you know, the super high end market of multi million dollar yachts is good. Uh, middle market is pretty well dead. And many of the dinghy companies that were producing are no longer there. Companies like Sage and Montgomery, et cetera, because there's a flood of plastic boats, fiberglass boats that are available for nothing. And so as we have an aging population, we also have people who, many of the people who build in our uh, our bill, our group builds are professionals. Most of them demographically are, you know, they're attorneys, accountants, et cetera. And to watch them coming from a cubicle somewhere where they're working, shuffling paper and watching them use a, plane or do something simple is so meaningful. Uh, and I also think people find that, you know, traffic, crowds, et cetera, it's a good way to get away easily. Mm. And so there is um, our perception of what's happening in the dinghy cruising area is helped a lot because of public media, right? We see what's going on. People post videos. Um, yep. So we see that, but the numbers on the water are increasing. There's now way over 700 sets of plans out for SCAMP, for example. And that's been it, well, one a week for years, right? It's been a very, very popular boat and it's an unusual boat, but it fits a particular demographic very, very well, right? The older guy who doesn't want to get wet anymore, in spite of the... Uh, the writing um, experiments, thank you, Matt. Uh, 
people of lesser physical fitness comfortably. They can go places, they can do things, and they can stay on the water. Whereas if they're sailing a laser somewhere around about in their late 50s, it just gets to be too much. Well, you know, the, the other thing is that if you look at the stresses people face, young couple graduates from college, they're in debt. They have kids. You know, the whole life cycle goes on. And time, people just don't seem to have as much time anymore. Uh, but I, I just did a scamp camp last month, uh, well attended. People, you know, very good occupations, great lives. Find that there's some empty spot in what they love to do. They're not interested in buying an, an old used boat for 500 bucks. They really want to create something. Mm. The creativity is a big part of it. You know, in, in the U.S., the common, you know, I've grown up sailing and racing. People say sailing is dead. Uh, you know, obviously there are yacht clubs that are, and there's club racing, but the growth market is our little niche. Yeah. That's the growth market. That's where the interest is. Um, yeah, other, another question just for you, Pat. Um, with um, your sailing canoe, um, I was wondering if you could just talk briefly about how uh, cruising in a sailing canoe like that, the pros and cons compared to a dinghy and sort of a, you know, a, a sea, a sort of sea kayak, off the shelf sea kayak. Uh, where does it sit and whatever the benefits are? Uh, well, the, there were two two canoes that you saw in the photos. One was uh, Klepper Arius One, you know, a skin on frame, wood, canvas, you know, Hypalon rubber boat. And that's a that's one of my favorite boats of all time. It, it's an amazing creature of the sea. It, you know, it, it, you know, moves a little bit with the ocean. It, it's really quite capable, but it's very, very limiting from a capacity standpoint. I, I didn't add the photo, but the photo that I could have added would have shown the full deck loads, fore and aft. You know, I, sitting in that boat, I was looking over a four deck load and a deck load behind me. It, you know, I ended up uh, burying that as a cap, food cache. The other canoe that you looked at is a very capable canoe, but it only has a little bit more room because it's all air forward, it's air along the sides, and it's air behind me. It's completely uh, um, buoyant. And that canoe I designed, uh, I lived in Micronesia for almost 20 years, and I had the canoe there. And I learned a trick from the Marshallese sailors, the Marshallese outrigger sailors. And this is what I would do. When I was in Pompeii, Micronesia, where I lived, we would often get these what are called white squalls. And all of a sudden, bright sunny day, there it comes, big white front coming with 30 or 40 knot winds. What I would do is I would simply roll up the jib and, you know, head towards, if I was headed towards the white squall, I would purpose capsize and then sit with the canoe like this, let it blow past, you know, 30, 40 knots, rain sideways flip it back up, hop in, and keep going. The flip side of that, if I would have tried to paddle through that, would have been really difficult. If I would have tried to sit, I couldn't have sailed through it. Um, I happen to like the sailing canoe. It's perhaps my favorite form of sailing uh, because it's so immediate. The water's right there. Tactically, it's the best. You know, and I, I built that particular canoe as a three-piece uh, ovoid carbon fiber spar that... Um, I spent a month making, but it weighs in pounds, it weighs about four pounds. So there's no way to loft. I can, again, the thirds, I can overpower the boat with my body, overpower the hull, the sail rig, that the sails that I built. Uh, I can actually, you know, maneuver that boat and control it at all times. Howard, you, you mentioned about the um, the, capability, the great capability of the Klepper canoes. Can you just let the audience know the, uh, the forerunner of um, the fine voyage. It was a Lindemann who, uh, uh, in his Klepper canoe. Uh, two Kleppers uh, crossed the Atlantic. Uh, one was uh, a Voss, and it was a it was a very custom, strange, long. I think it was twenty one feet long. But Hannes um, Lindemann took a standard Aries two and uh, modified it slightly and had a single outrigger. Um, and practiced uh he was a very interesting guy a physician he he was a practitioner of voodoo and he would put himself into trances he carried condensed milk and beer basically and you know beer is bread 
And so he lived off the sea. Um, and But that's only part of the Klepper story. You know, Kleppers were taken to the South Pole with Bird. They've done a number of expeditions uh, through history. Um, and I was involved with Kleppers for a number of years. I still own a couple of Kleppers. They're incredibly durable, uh, classic boats. They were also used in wartime. Uh, yeah. They, yeah, they were used to, uh, you know, stick limpet mines on ships. And um, I worked with with uh, my dear friend Eric Stiller, who he and his father were the importers in the U.S., and we did trainings with U.S. Navy SEALs and uh, Army combat swimmers, uh, special forces groups, and they would recount stories of, you know, taking a clepper down a river uh, loaded with uh, plastic explosives, because how do you blow up a bridge? Well, you can either put explosives on it or you can blow it up with a geyser of water. And, you know, for the cost of a clepper, that's a pretty cost-effective way to do something. Um, he and I also commissioned some cleppers that went to the first uh, desert storm, uh, war, the war in Iraq. Uh, so they are very, very but capable boats. We'd, we'd probably better stop on the cleppers because I think John, uh, J John's been, a lot of people have been asking John to design the next boat beyond the scamp and the long steps. But with all this talk of clappers, he'll be working out some sort of canoe to design as the next thing, and we don't want to take him from his work. Does anyone else have any questions? No. Uh, the next question is actually coming from a friend of both of yours, Ben Tucker. Oh, hey, hey Ben. Hello. How are you going? Uh, Good to see you. This one's for you, John. Um, I've always noticed with your boats um, a strong similarity to the cobbles in England and Yorkshire, where I used to live for a while. Um, is that a case of sort of convergent evolution or is it um do you have a background with the cobbles okay now in part it's because of the construction method which is glued plywood lap strap so that has strong horizontal lines in part because i want the boat to connect with the image in, that people have in their minds when they think of a very capable, small, traditionally styled boat, they will have a picture in their mind. And that's a very common one, that type of boat, right? The underwater sections are actually much more akin to that racing yacht, right? Known as Navman, the mini transat. So the underwater is, is, is a different sets of set of processes that's function form up above partly dictated by the construction method but i'm styling like those northeast coast uk boats because people see them and and it calls to them you know there's a something that we we share as a common philosophy and i term it as uh, f squared good form typically equals good function flip it function typically leads to good form when you see odd extreme boats they typically don't work very well uh, ben i'm sure you probably think the same way maybe everyone there does but uh, i find for example uh, i i happen to really like john's boats not specifically because he's my friend but if i look at all the current designers of small boats i won't name others but his resonate with me from an aesthetic standpoint, but it's not just an aesthetic. If the function wasn't there, I, I wouldn't be interested. I'd still be his friend, but I wouldn't be interested. I, I wouldn't drool over your long steps, for example. That's a sweet job you did. Uh, or the navigator or the scamp. I happen to think the scamp is a really handsome little boat. You know, some people get stuck in the pram bow, but think about it. The two largest classes, I think, in the world are the Optimus pram and the mirror dinghy. Um, so that, you know, the history is long and that form function works very well for me. If the forefoot wasn't there, I probably wouldn't like it so much. And um, the bottom shape, all of it adds together to be a, a very functional design. Hmm. Uh, now the, the, the beginnings of you know, as to what's next, would you like to hear that? Yes, we would. Uh, we would love to hear what's next. There's uh, been a lot of scuttlebutt about it, but I think we need to hear it from the horse's mouth. Okay. Nah. He, called, he called you a horse. <laughs> hey. Um. Yeah. So, a sixteen and a half 
foot long scamp with a cabin big enough to have two bunks inside, a space big enough to put the smallest Thetford porta potty away, a little beach to put your stove on, um, water ballasted, ballast lug. It's got the same rig. In fact, it's got the same sails as long steps. Scallywag, is it? Scallywag. Scallywag. The plans are <laughs> I just need to go through and refine them a bit. Scallywag. Scallywag. <laughs> well, if you're going to have a bigger, and it'll look just like Scamp's big sister. You know, it's funny, but for a while, when Scamp came out, it really uh, became popular quickly for some reason. Uh, something about it resonated with many people. Oh, when, make it a foot longer. You know, make it two feet longer. That's not a Scamp. A Scamp is a Scamp. It's, it is what it mm. is. Yeah. So this is a, a, yeah. a good answer. So this is this is Scallywag. For, for people who have been sailing a Scamp for a while who want to be able to go indoors and lie down in a bunk. When, when do we see the plans for that, John? Mm? When will we see the plans? Uh, give us a couple of months. Sorry. All right. I've got a couple more questions. Uh, next one's coming from Peter Manthorpe over here. You probably can't see him. Um, hey, Peter, up here, I can't see you. That's right. Uh, <laughs> my, um, my question is, uh, what's next, too? How, have you got any um, incredible adventures planned? Yeah, they're, well, um, here is pretty good, actually. This yeah. little island. But, yes, I'm in full swing, uh, absolutely full swing on uh, a next voyage, and he's involved. He's going to be... Uh, traveling there with me, and then I'll set off. And yep, I'm the sure support up to the point of departure. Yeah, yeah. you know. So <laughs> we, we, we heard uh, we heard heard rumors there may be a literary voyage. Would you like to speak oh. about that? We, we, heard, oh, what? we heard there may be a, a literary voyage going on. Oh, there is that. We've yeah. finally we've been yakking about it for a long time. We've yeah. both written a number of things. We're, we're writing a book. There it is. We're going to publish a book. We're going to finish it. We've made a blood pact. It's, uh, yeah, might as well do it again. Yeah. <laughs> I've got a copy of the Shorter Oxford Dictionary, right? It's got every word. I think it's got 80,000 words in it. So all we have to do is shuffle them into the right order. <laughs> <laughs> one more question, I think, from John out in the centre here. Yes, one for you, Howard. Uh, you spoke about preparation, the importance of preparation, uh, but you didn't mention food and water for a 53-day voyage in an 11-foot boat. How did you manage that? Very badly. <laughs> um, well, I guess I better fess up. Yeah. Okay. Well... It went like this. So I built this beautiful boat. I built a beautiful main mast, built a beautiful mizzen mast. And then I was under the gun to actually meet a truck that was coming to pick it up. And they said, if you're not there tomorrow by 12 o'clock, we're going to give you one hour, we leave. So the truck would pick it up and take it to the shipping point. Uh, and the boat was in a crate, you know, they're a large 16 foot by five foot by six foot crate. Um, and so all of my food was prepackaged, uh, heavily influenced by something called tubu tubu. Uh, I happen to be a vegetarian, um, and I, so my it was a grain based diet uh, for that particular voyage. And I was going to buy uh, fresh food, you know, staples in uh, Punta Arenas. And so what happened is somebody drove over my mizzen mast and yeah. what somebody drove over my mizzen mast and crushed it uh literally 12 hours before the boat was to go on the truck it was a windy now here's how it happened it was a windy day and there were leaves all over the place and i was rushing around trying to get it in the i did it and so i called john what did it sound like <laughs> So I grabbed, I, instead of going for my food, which was all prepackaged and done, all, you know, done up and vacuum sealed, I went for the lumber yard. I had to make a choice. So I left all my food behind and I bought two Sitka boards and John Wellsford and I built a mast. Yep. So I packed a number three Stanley hand plane, a, um, a stone to sharpen it with, some chisels, a draw knife, and a few other bits and pieces. 
he put the epoxy and the wood in there and we built a new mast on the steps of the motel. On, well, on the shore of the Strait of Magellan, mm. in the shadow of the HMS Beagle, um, in the rain and sleet and the wind, and I use that mast to this day. It's a work of art. Thank you very much. We did good. <laughs> yeah, so that's kind of what I didn't do for food. And so what I did do for food when I got to Chile was I changed everything. I had to, uh, I bought containers of yogurt. I bought uh, canned sardines. I bought six bottles of Guinness um, and onions, uh, oranges, limes, lemons, carrots, uh, garlic. And so I did a lot of cooking uh, that I didn't plan on doing. On my first trip, uh, around Cape Horn in the Klepper, where I had 91 days. It, well, it wasn't 91 days. I did a short, a little resupply. I had food for 70 days. That was all done by a friend of mine who is a nutritionist. And I aimed at 5,000 calories a day on that trip. And I lost 35 pounds in the end because I never got back to my food cache. But that was all nut butters, and uh, high, you know, protein, high energy foods, lots of carbohydrates. And what about water? Water? Um, in Tierra del Fuego, the first time I went there, uh, my research told me that I would be able to find water everywhere. And that is true. Now, some of the water was a little discolored, had high tannic acid in it. But in Tierra del Fuego, there's so much... Uh, loam on the ground you have to be careful walking there are places where i walked on my first trip once i was walking along and i fell through the ground and i ended up i was hanging in a tree uh this had overgrown under a tree i would have dropped under rocks 20 feet below but i could take my hand and punch it into the ground and pull it out and water would come out and so i had a pump on this last trip and i would you know pump water out of uh, glacial streams so i carried on average, I carried about, uh, I don't know, two gallons. Uh, my, built, my ballast tank had uh, rectangular Nalgene bottles in it and a grease pencil. Those, when I got to the Southern Ocean, were filled completely. So my entire ballast tank was filled with water. And the concept was I could take one out, use the water, mark it with a grease pencil, fill it with salt water, and put it back in. And then the surrounding area around the Nalgene's was filled, topped off with salt water. So I typically carried about one or two gallons. And when I got far south, I tanked up completely. Yep. So any more questions? Well, I would like to say that there are four things that you need for a happy life. You need someone to love, someone to love you, something to do, and a dream and the john wellsford uh, idea of designing boats which are fit for purpose and can be built by home builders and mugs and professionals alike um certainly fulfills the the two later aspects of that that's certainly something to do and using those boats fulfills the greatest dream that any person could have to build their own boat and go on and have an adventure and so we at the wooden boat guild of tasmania and small craft tasmania we're absolutely um, thrilled and delighted that we could have an audience with um, John Wellsford and Howard Rice and that you would give up your time and the preparation of your wonderful talks to share your philosophy, your knowledge, your love of boats and your love of life. And we're extremely grateful for the opportunity and you're just absolute champions. In actual fact, I'd say that you are eximious, <laughs> eminent, distinguished, select, most excellent. And it is in the Shorter Oxford Dictionary. I think it's simpler than thank you very much, but it would be twin brothers, different mothers. <laughs> thank you, everybody. Thank you. It's been an honor. I hope that I hope that we see you in Tasmania soon. You yeah. will. You will. You're welcome. Yeah. You're welcome. Great. Yep. Great. Thank you, gentlemen. Enjoy your dinner. Good night. Thank you very much. Yeah. Have Bye. a wonderful evening. Bye -bye. Tasmania. Make sure you hit the subscribe button because there's plenty more content to come.